Hello, everybody. We're just going to give this a few more minutes as people file in for the presentation today. Give it about another 30 seconds and we'll get going. All right. Well, thank you, everybody, for uh, for joining us. I wish it was under better circumstances, but what, my name is Brian Kelly, first uh, CEO of the Small Business Association of Michigan. Not to be confused, by the way, uh, with the Small Business Administration of the United States federal government, similar sounding names, different uh, organizations. Thank you so much for joining us today. We're going to talk about the adopt and amend decision. I spent the last day going over the decision, talking to some uh, colleagues, kind of debating back and forth and what certain things mean. I want to bring you up to speed on what we've learned and uh, and hopefully give you some, um, uh, at least some confidence that you understand what's coming. And, um, and then we'll, we'll give you a way to plug in and be a part of our efforts in trying to make, um, take the edge off or make some changes to uh, some of the ramifications that uh, that come along with uh, with this decision. So let's just jump right in. First is that this this adopt and amend decision. It was really a question of legislative procedure. What was before the Supreme Court was a question of whether or not the legislature at the end of 2018 properly passed new laws that uh, that changed sick leave policy and overtime laws in Michigan. So it was not a matter of the substance of whether or not minimum wage is good or bad or whether or not paid sick leave is good or bad. It was a matter of whether or not the the process used to change the law was proper or not. And they decided that the process was not proper. To get, be more specific, what they said was that a law that was initiated through the citizens initiated law process, which is a constitutional process, that if the legislature adopts it before it comes to a vote, then they may not amend that law during the same legislative term. It creates kind of a new class of law that if it passes in that way, then it's not till the next term that it can be changed. So what does that really mean? That's what this proposal or what this uh, pr um presentation is all about. The decision did come down to a 5-3 uh, uh, decision along party lines. It sounds a little bit weird to say party lines uh, when you're talking about the Supreme Court, but the political parties do nominate people that serve on the uh, on the Supreme Court, and this one did fall along party lines. The, um, the uh, First, let's talk about the effective date. So February 21st, which is a little over 200 days from now, uh, is when the um, when the the new uh, so I'm going to go ahead and say the new law, even though technically it's the old law that is being brought back. But when the new conditions, the new requirements take effect on February 21st, and um, and then uh, of 2025, and then there are additional changes annually through uh, February uh, 21st of 2029. It's important to note, and I, I this is underlined on, in this presentation, so you, get, you don't have to change anything right now. Okay, there's there's nothing that immediately goes into effect in this law. So I don't want you to feel like you've got to rush out and change your employee handbook or change schedules on your you know sick time uh, accruals or your um, or your overtime um, and or uh, your uh, minimum wage if you have minimum wage employees or if you're uh, utilize the tip credit in your business there's several different aspects that that will be impacted in the future but none of it takes effect immediately nothing changes until February 21st 2025 so we're going to go through and you're going to get our best, my best understanding of what this, uh, what these changes say, uh, but understand that there'll be additional uh, resources and information that come available here into the future between now and when it takes effect. Three big changes 
in, um, in, in this decision, the three main things. The first is it establishes a new series of increases for the regular minimum wage. So right now the minimum wage is 1033 an hour. That changes every January 1st by, by a factor of inflation. So they look at inflation in the previous year uh, and, and then they set the minimum wage for the, for the next year. So for example, we already know that minimum wage starting January 1st of 2025, before this decision happened, was already set to go up to $10.56. So that's the current law. There's a series of changes that'll be made to current law that we'll cover on, uh, on coming slides. The second is to, um, is to phase out the tipped wage credit. So if you have a restaurant and you have workers that, um, that operate or that are employed under the tipped wage credit, you'll, you'll know that the actual um, percentage of minimum wage that shows up as like an hourly wage for that employee is 38% of the minimum wage. That's, uh, but, the employer has to guarantee that with tips, they make at least the minimum wage. And of course, most servers make uh, far beyond that. I haven't put it in this presentation, but our friends at the Michigan Restaurant and Lodging Association have done some great survey work of, uh, of servers and restaurant employees, and have found that 83%, get this, 83% of workers in that industry do not want the tipped credit to go away. They don't want to fall under the regular minimum wage system because they make more money under the current system. But under this decision yesterday, the tipped wage will be phased out and it will be no more unless there's legislative action taken. And then there's a, a, um, a specific and very complex set of uh, paid sick leave benefit changes. And we'll spend some time on those as well. Those are the three big changes. So let's talk about the minimum wage and the uh, tipped credit. I'm putting these two changes together because one is a function of the other. So you got the minimum wage and then the tipped credit is a percentage of the minimum wage. So back in 2018, there was this law proposed, the legislature adopted it and then amended it, okay, to our current system that changes by inflation every year. Before they did that, there was a schedule, and that schedule's up on the screen right now. It said January 1st, 2019, the minimum wage increases at $10 an hour. And then by 2020, it goes up 6.5% six and six and to 10.65, and then 11.35, and then $12, and then up by uh, the uh, CPI or inflation thereafter. In parentheses, you'll see what the tip credit, instead of being 38% as it is today, it will it would it would become forty eight percent of the of the regular minimum wage and then sixty percent of the regular minimum wage and it keeps on going up until it's the same no tipped credit the tipped credit system and the minimum wage are are the, are the same tipped credit system goes away so that's that's what was in law that's what the legislature changed to when when the legislative changes got struck down it it means generally that this goes back back into effect however. These dates are already passed. And so the big question beyond how will the court decide was what are they going to do with uh, with the schedule in the future, given that all of these dates have already passed? Well, it's a little complex. I want to apologize. I'm going to try to make this as simple as possible and take the, you know, the legal and the government speak and translate it into regular English. But the way that this... Um, the way that this decision went down is they essentially set a new schedule pegged or based off the one that had already passed. So uh, for example, they're saying, and, and let me actually, let me put a little big asterisk on this one. This part of the decision is complex and difficult to understand. I have seen several different interpretations of it. What I'm giving you today is what I think that that determination means and um, what some lawyers that we're connected to think that it means. And we will continue to refine and update this and ultimately we'll know for sure when the Department of Labor's uh, Wage and Hour Division publishes the new rates. But even they are trying to figure out what this decision means. So 
on February 1st of 2025, remember that's the date, nothing changes before then, February 1st, 2025, the minimum wage will be $10, remember that's what it was supposed to go to in 2019, $10 plus inflation between then and July 31st, 2024. So they'll take that $10 number from before, they will add inflation and, and essentially that will be the new number. Now, you'd think you'd be able to just precisely determine what that is, but I mean, inflation, depending on what the, the base and when you start that and when you end it, we know when the end point is, July 31st, 2024, we don't really know the starting point for inflation. It's hard to nail down exactly what the number is, but doing calculations, I think it's going to be about 1250, let's say between 1230 and 1250 an hour. We will know for sure in a week or two. I think it'll be about a week or two when the department, the state department publishes the rate, but the amount will go up a pretty substantial amount. Remember today it's 1033, January 1st of next year, it's going to go up to 1056. And then it's going to go up again. Um, that was just the old schedule. And then this new schedule kicks in uh, February 21st, 2025. It'll go up to somewhere around 1250. And then the old schedule adjusted by inflation kicks in for each of these successive years. And kind of as a general rule of thumb, I think when after you add in inflation, that around 250 an hour on these numbers, on the old schedule, you add about 250 an hour to it, and that's what your new schedule is going to look like. Here's a big thing that we don't know, though, is the fact that the end of the schedule requires just on into infinity the it gets adjusted by inflation every year will it be these new numbers plus an additional year of inflation as we go on into the future i think that's um it's a big question mark the decision is not particularly clear but one thing is clear it will go up percentage wise it's going to go up quite a bit um and um i'm estimating the first increase will be somewhere around 1250 and um, now if you look that same schedule will look familiar. Um, the tip credit goes from 38% of minimum wage up to 48%. So think if you're a restaurant, it's kind of like a double whammy. Not only is the tipped credit smaller, so you have to pay a higher percentage of the minimum wage, but also minimum wage has gone up. So it's a higher percentage of a higher number. And that happens each year. It goes from 48% to 60%, to 70%, to 80% to 100%. And after uh, February 1st, 2029, it will the tip credit would be no more absent intervention from the legislature. Okay. So um, with respect to paid sick leave, uh, I'm going to ask that you bear with me as we go through this because this has gotten the least amount of attention you know, minimum wage is the thing. It's always the headline. People pay all this attention on minimum wage, but there are substantial changes that will affect virtually every business with employees uh, under this uh, paid sick leave. The minimum wage may or may not affect you as a business. You might have people that are making under minimum wage or close to minimum wage and or not. You might utilize the tips, uh, tips wage system or not, but these paid sick leave requirements, they will, if you have any employees, one or more employee, these will affect you and very good chances are what's required under this law is not something that you're doing today. Okay, so what does current law say? Current law says that businesses with 50 or more employees have to provide paid sick leave of at least 40 hours per year. And then there's a total exemption for any business with fewer than 50 employees. So there's no requirement for paid sick leave. And the paid sick leave that is required for businesses with 50 or more, that paid sick leave is, is a pretty flexible um, paid sick leave policy. It's one that's very manageable in terms of how it's administered. That will be different. So if you're even if you are a business that is already providing paid sick leave and you have more than 50 employees, the way that you do it is going to change. And that's what we're going to talk about here today. So first... The, um, the, the big overarching change is that the 50 employee exemption goes away. 
So all businesses with any employees will have to provide a paid sick leave benefit. So any business with 10 or more employees, it's uh, at least 72 hours of paid sick leave each year. It, and it accrues in an hour for every 30 hours worked. Okay, so then um, if you have um, fewer than 10, so one to nine employees, then you must provide sick leave, paid sick leave of at least um, 40 hours per year. So instead of 72, it's 40. And, um, and so that comes out to one hour for every 40 hours worked. The, um, so there is a, um, there's a lot of type on this slide and we're going to provide these slides. They're going to be available to you so you can take a look at it. And there's also an SBAM resource page, which digs into all of this stuff. And I want to invite you to go to sbam.org and you can spend some time with it. We've got a nice grid on this paid sick leave requirements show what the current law is and what it's changing to under this scenario. So um, the first is um, the, the first thing to just understand it's complex and we're going to go through this. And at the end of it, you're probably going to be frustrated because you'd be like, why do they have to make it so hard? Mm -hmm. The um, it's one thing to require the, the benefit. It's another thing to go as far as they have done here and making it difficult to comply with and um, and just really kind of changing the employer employee relationship to to a to an unnecessary extent. So the first is that the benefit, the mandated benefit, applies to all employees, and um, that um, all employees would include seasonal workers, part time workers, of course, full time workers. Um, there is actually some dispute, I'll call it confusion, around whether or not it applies to independent contractors and temporary employees. Like it does apply to those two, but does it, if you use a temp, do you have to provide it or is it the temp agency that has to provide it? That's where the confusion lies. But this is an all encompassing uh, type of a benefit. It accrues according to the hours that are worked. And there is no, you can't say, well, it's only for full time employees. It's for, uh, for all employees of the business and perhaps beyond employees, independent contractors and temps. But um, but again, that uh, that part is, is unclear at this point. Um, employees become eligible immediately. You can't put any sort of wait time on this. You can't say, oh, you got to be an employee for 90 days before uh, sick leave kicks in. It begins accruing with the first, um, with the first day worked. So that is a um, that accrual is something, and then the benefit is not something that you can uh, set a waiting limit on. The um, now here's a, here's a part that you know as many of you will relate to, is that there's a common practice, a trend on moving more toward general leave banks of time, so you don't have like sick time and personal time and vacation time. It's all one big leave bank and, and you can use it for any reason. So it begs the question, what if I have one of these general leave banks and it's greater than the requirements of sick leave? Can I count that toward my sick leave requirements? Maybe, but you have to grant all, everything in that pool has to be granted under the same terms as the sick leave which is in a lot of cases is not feasible. Like for example, you can't require notice. Somebody who's gonna take uh, time off, like a week off uh, for vacation, they have to give notice to you, right? You They submit for the vacation, you approve it. And if, if you count your vacation toward the sick leave, you can't require notice anymore. And so anyway, it'll make it logistically very difficult to use other types of leave to count toward this, uh, this, type, this uh, benefit. It accrues at a rate of one hour per 30 hours uh, worked for business with 10 or more employees. So that's an, it's an accrual. Um, the, um, so in, you know, that first out, that first uh, 40 hours uh, worked, there would be, um, there would be an accrual that you'd have to keep track of uh, and, and um, in place in, um, in this employees paid leave benefit if they're um, at the, uh, if they're a smaller uh, business of fewer than 10 employees, as I mentioned before, it's one hour for every 40 hours worked. But here's the thing. There's a little asterisk on this. 
40 hours a week for a full-time employee of a, of a smaller business with nine or fewer employees. That's the paid benefit. But you also have to provide the difference between that and the bigger businesses, 72 hours. You have to provide the rest of it as a guaranteed unpaid leave benefit to the employees. So every employee, every full-time employee is, in, is entitled to 72 hours of leave. The small business difference in this case only applies to the paid leave, not the overall leave. Okay, so hopefully that's clear. Again, sbm.org, we've got a really awesome grid that you can go down and, and look and compare current law with new law to study up on this. Um, you must allow the benefits to carry over year to year. So you can't say, well, you didn't use it this year, therefore we're going to uh, reabsorb that and start fresh. You must allow unused sick time to carry over to the next year. And um, see a lot of businesses, once you qualify for a benefit at the beginning of the year, they'll give you the whole year's benefit, like put it in. in. Um, but as it's written today, that's really not allowed. And the reason that it's not allowed is because the um, is because if you front end load it, then you don't under current labor laws, you don't have to carry that over. But if it's an accrued benefit that accrues every, you know, per hour worked, then that does have to carry over. So that's the reason why they don't want it front end loaded. This is one where I think, you know, probably administratively they'll allow front end loading because it's pro employee, but the, um, but as long as you allow to let it be um, carried over. So I'm sort of expecting that, um, I'm sort of expecting that to be the case, um, but we'll see. As it's written today, it's not um, something that would carry over. All right, the, um, the uh, actually, let me, sorry, let me go back here. Um, the, uh, the last thing on this page that I wanted to share was that the paid benefit um, rate, it has to, like, if employees have any sort of variability to their, income. So imagine, you know, somebody who's not salaried, maybe subject to overtime, there's an average hourly rate that they earned in the previous um, pay period. That's what you have to use for the whenever the sick leave is paid. So you could imagine a scenario where um, people take a lot of sick time after they get a lot of overtime. So I got a bunch of overtime, I'm going to take my sick time because now my average um, wage that I earned and that my sick leave will be based on is or the previous pay period's average wage. So that's a moving target. So it's one of the things where administratively just would be more complex to keep track of. Now, um, the um, the employer, okay, so here's the one I'm going to say, I apologize for making your blood pressure go up, but this is the part that I think you're going to find uh, pretty frustrating is that you may not require any documentation for any leave of less than three days. So, or three days or less. So, um, and this will create a scenario that I'll get into in a moment, but like, it's not unusual to say, okay, somebody's using sick leave. They didn't give any notice. They were gone uh, for a few days. And then they, they come back, you know, with a doctor slip or something. Um, now, you may require some document documentation for leave that goes beyond three days, but you can only limit the documentation from being from a healthcare professional. So you might have a, a handbook that says with a note from a doctor, you can't say from a doctor. It has to be from a quote healthcare professional. And that's not defined in there. Um, or it's, it's like, it, it seems to be quite broad. How, how do you decide who's a healthcare professional who can sign off on somebody's absence? And then and, uh, if you do require that, then you have to pay for any cost of obtaining that that came out of the employee's pocket. So in practice, what this part of the law creates is, um, is that for full-time employees, um, they'll have like this intermittent leave time each year to use as like a no-call, no-show allowance. Because if somebody uses this benefit, it doesn't have to provide any kind of documentation or notice. The, the law says, you know, you, give, you, you need to give notice 
you know, if it's feasible to give notice, but there's no, it's the employee decides whether or not it's feasible. So the, um, so somebody could a no call, no show three day allowance, and you can't take any disciplinary action. You can't require any documentation. You, there's no, there's nothing. You just have to, to let it happen. And so um, that is a, um, that's a, a section that I think is, you know, is, is ripe for some, some problems. And then documentation, you must track hours. Okay. So you might, you might think, well, I've got, you know, I've got a certain amount of sick time um, and it complies with this law. I don't really need to keep track of it, but how do you know if you're accruing the right amount according to how many hours a person is actually working? You, you have to be able to prove that because in the law, there is a presumption that if you, within the last three years, if you are unable to produce documentation, the presumption is that the employer is at fault in, a, in any sort of dispute. So, um, so you, you have to keep documentation, keep track of when people are working, the hours that they work to ensure that the uh, accruals are done appropriately. Um, and that might not be something that if you've got like a, a thing where it's like, hey, full-time employees have this kind of leave um, that's available to them and you don't even track hours because the benefit is what it is. You have to make sure that um, that the benefit meets the accrual requirements and it requires documentation. And that might be an adjustment for some employees to have to account for their, their time, uh, which since the pandemic, there's a lot of business practices that don't really really operate on, on that way with the like, accountability by the hours. Um, okay, one bright spot. And the one bright spot is there's this big question said, okay, what if the Supreme Court overturns this law? What happens with a uh, client, what if some, what if an employee says, hey, my minimum wage was supposed to go up back in 2019 and I've been working all this time for my employer. I wanna sue them so that they have to pay me back wages for um, for the time that this law, you know, this this law, this older law should have still been in place. And the Supreme Court said, no, you can't, you can't do this. This is a forward looking change. It doesn't allow for collection on, um, on what somebody thinks should have happened according to this law between 2019 and uh, February 21st of 2025, when this takes effect. Uh, a couple of things now, what can you do? Um, first is to, to recognize that by delaying implementation until February 21st, it does give some time for the legislature or the governor to act to make changes. Okay, so the, the, the Supreme Court said the legislature couldn't make changes in 2018 because it was the same year that the initiative was adopted, the same legislative term. We are several terms removed from that. The legislature could make adjustments today. And so I want to ask you to please consider contacting your legislators and the governor, especially if you know one personally, to say, hey, there are so many of these uh, changes. This is going to be a real hardship on my small business. I really need you to uh, to, to make some changes, encourage them to work with SBAM uh, or to, to hear directly from you on and what needs to happen going forward. But we want to make it as easy as possible for you to speak into the system. So please um, you can, you know, we, we sent out an email yesterday with the link, but you can put in your address. It will populate who represents you and create a, um, a communication out to them. I want to encourage you to consider doing that. We're also going to drop into the, um, into the chat a, a, um, a survey. And the survey is our regular quarterly business climate survey that we do. But we added some questions about we're trying to gauge how how much these main changes are going to, to impact our members. And we'll use that data to communicate into the system. So if you could take 10 minutes or so and do our general business climate survey and include some questions on this adopt and amend change, and it will help us with our work. Um, next week, we don't I don't have a date for you yet, but keep your eyes on, on sbam.org and uh, in your emails from us. And you will uh, see an invitation for a more in-depth webinar. And we'll bring in, this has been kind of Brian Kelly's interpretation of things. And even though um, I slept in a Holiday Inn Express last night, I'm not a lawyer. Um, I didn't actually, I slept in my own bed. But the um, we'll have a, um, 
we'll have a, um, a partner from um, Warner Norcross that will join us and we can get even more into the weeds on things and we'll have more information at that point you know that that will be available we're continuing to investigate this we want to make sure that you are as um as um, prepared as you possibly can be i see we've had a lot of comments that have come in we'll go ahead and leave this um this slide up while we take some of these uh comments in the hopes that some of you will uh will fo follow the uh the code there and maybe respond to the call to action while we're yet on this webinar all right sarah what do we got in terms of questions Sure. Yeah. Several questions came in and I feel like some of them you did answer to the best of your ability while, um, you know, through the presentation, but there's a question about sick leave and what, um, how it applies to employees of Michigan based businesses, but are located in other states. Yeah. Great question. And, um, there'll have to be some rules that come out later, um, on that, but I believe that any employee that is located in Michigan, even if they're working for an employer, somebody else will be entitled to this benefit. If you are a Michigan business who has employees in other states, normal kind of nexus standards would not, it wouldn't carry, those states have their own rules. Uh, so it normally wouldn't carry over, but we will have to see some ad administrative rules. But if you are a worker that is located in Michigan, I believe that this will um, this requirement will apply to any workers and and uh, located within our borders. All right, kind of another question about this carryover or the accrual. Can you set a limit as to how much can actually be carried over and or accrued? Great question. Um, normally, there are limits that can be carried over and accrued. the the um, The law puts a minimum that has to be accrued per year. It does not set a maximum that can be carried over year by year. So this would be a great example of the sort of thing where when we're when we're working with the legislature that we need to we need to have some sort of moderation of, of, of the impact that this has on small businesses. So these long term accruals can have big impacts on people's balance sheets and it can and then if a long term employee there's never used sick leave leaves and there's a big liquidation event, it is a, uh, it can be a real hardship. So some sort of limit should be put on it. We're going to ask the legislature to put a limit on it, but as things stand today, uh, there's no limit lit written into the law. All right. Somebody asked if this is only a Michigan wage adjustment, will it affect tribal businesses? Boy, that's a great question. And I don't know. Um, I don't know the answer to that. Um, I, I think the, I believe that the answer will end up being that if, if you are a business within the boundaries of a tribal nation, that um, that state laws, even things in our constitution, do not directly or automatically apply. So, um, decent chances are that um, that there that uh, that those businesses would be exempt as they are from other um, rules and uh, and requirements, but I don't know that for sure. All right. Somebody asks, is this considered a fringe benefit? Um, so would it be, you know, would, would we be required to pay it out at termination or, you know, ending a relationship? You would be required to pay it out at the end of the relationship. Yeah. Um, and so th that's, that's really one of our concerns with the carryover, um, that is uh, that could be quite expensive in terms of uh, especially you know you think about the um, bigger businesses and how they operate and how their balance sheets work um, you know people that are coming and go it's like kind of worked into it but when you have a smaller team these changes can be very very detrimental and uh, and so uh, and these individual events can uh, can can really have a a huge negative impact. It's part of the message that we need to carry forward when we're asking for changes. So it's, I'm not under any illusion that when we go through and work with within the legislature to try to make changes, that they're just going to make that they're just going to go through and make everything how it was before. They're not going to do that. But as we go through piece by piece and can say, yeah, but th let me tell you how this would impact small businesses. This part needs to change. And this part over here needs to change. And that's part of our job is to really go through and determine what are the um, what are the big um, 
differences that uh, that and hardships that small businesses will face and the people are truly small business and all the politicians love to act like there's pro small business. This will be a great time for them to prove it. Brian, some conversation in the chat about people who have like three day no show policies in terms of, you know, no call, no show policies that that would, you know, terminate employment. And would this essentially make it difficult to, to let somebody go? Yes. Unfortunately, if the employee, unless the employee says, doesn't know that they can invoke their paid sick leave benefit, I don't really know what you can do to avoid that as the law is written today. I believe that this creates a scenario where you are giving an allowance to people every year. No call, no show, up to three days. You can't ask for any documentation for them to justify the absence. And you cannot take any disciplinary action. And firing would be an example of disciplinary action. So it does create a no show, no, no call, no show allowance every year. And if you were to fire somebody and they were to say, well, it was because I was sick, then um, you would have no ground to stand on because you the law would not even make it legal for you to ask for documentation for them to prove it. So unfortunately, um, th this would make it difficult to let somebody go until they were a no call, no show for the fourth day. Um, Brian, do you have a sense for how this um, compares to what other states are doing for paid leave? Yeah, this is, um, I would call this on the extreme end. Um, this is a, um, the, the, uh, they're out of state groups, mainly from, uh, from the West Coast that are trying to get policies like this passed all over the country for whatever reason. Well, actually, I know the reason because our constitution makes it easier to, to, to pass things like this through citizens initiatives. So if you have millions of dollars, you can um, kind of force an issue without going through the reg regular legislative process. And so what happens is Michigan is kind of an early target state. So these things happen in California, things like this happen there, and then they move to places like Michigan early in the process. So this is an unusual, especially there's certain pieces of this that are in place in other places, but the totality of this, all these things, particularly the paid sick leave, there's so many aspects of it as pro that are problematic top to bottom um, that uh, it, it, would, it would make Michigan an outlier compared to most states. All right. So there's there's more questions that keep coming in. I you know, Brian, I'm not sure you're scheduled how many more we can do, but is there are there is there a cap at how many three day periods per year would be allowed per employee? So like it is three days per year per employee. Okay. Oh, so okay. yeah, and it doesn't and they don't have to be consecutive either. That's the thing, is that somebody could be a no call, no show what to just one day. And then a couple months later, they can do another day. And so during that, uh, during a one year period, they have this no call, no show allowance. And um, and so it's uh, it's not it's not that you can do three over and over again. It is three days total over the period of a year. And by the way, you can't a lot of times sick policies today, they'll say like, oh, you have to take at least a half a day or a full day at a time. Um, this doesn't have any um you can't set those minimums. Whatever your payroll system is based on, if your payroll system can keep track of increments of 15 minutes, you know, somebody's working an hour and and uh, 15 minutes, and so you pay them for an hour and 15 minutes, if it has that type of increment, then um, you have to allow them to take the sick benefit on those increments as well. So imagine that no call, no show. So let's let's think of the most extreme example. And again, I'm not trying to raise your blood pressure. I just want to illustrate why this needs to change and how badly we need the legislature to change it. That you could have somebody that is chronically late for work virtually every day. And as long as it doesn't accumulate to three days of no call, no show, and they just invoke every day, well, I wasn't, I was sick this morning, then um chronically late is also something that you can't, again, until you go after over three days total, you can't take any disciplinary action at all. And there are stiff penalties if you do. So um, 
this and as you go through, I covered one thing where it's like, you know, if you don't have the right documentation, then employers are assumed to be in the wrong. But that's sprinkled throughout the whole thing, that the presumption is always against the employer in this law. So in any of these cases, if you push the envelope, if you're kind of operating in, in areas where it's like, yeah, but that person's abusing it and they're just doing it. The presumption is against you as an employer. The assumption is that you broke the rules. You have to prove that you didn't. All right, I'm going to make a suggestion. We have a lot of very specific questions coming in. So Brian, what I'd like to do is compile the questions that we're seeing in the chat and here in the Q&A, and then we can create a document that kind of dives into these a little bit um, you know, more in depth, but definitely seeing a lot of concern from, from our members, and we want to make sure we're able to help them navigate it best, best we can. So um, that yeah. document plus the Warner Norcross Judd webinar next week, I think will be a good next step. Yeah, very good. And I, you know, I appreciate everybody being on the, on the webinar here. If you put two questions in there, that will help us develop FAQs to think of different scenarios that maybe we didn't come up with on our own to really dig in. And then we will continue to populate and, and update our website with more and more information as we get through. Um, you know, some of this, again, it's, this is my studied interpretation of uh, of what's happened so far. We will learn more. There will be times uh, when maybe the, the labor department will come out with a set of rules and something won't be quite as onerous as what my interpretation was. I hope for that to be the case. As that information comes out, we will make it available to you. Please do make a habit of checking back at sbam.org. And again, please take a few minutes to fill out our survey. And um, because that will help us on this issue, but a whole, whole bunch of other issues that are in there too. It just helps us with what's happening with small businesses and follow this QR code and, um, and, and complete a call to action. Make sure that your legislators are hearing from you so that, um, so that they know they have to make this a priority. This is an election year. They don't pass a lot of laws and changes to laws in election years, or at least not until lame duck after the November election. We really, really need them to uh, to come back this fall and deal with this issue, uh, even though this doesn't take effect until February 1st. February 1st will be here before we know it. So I do want um, the, the legislature to start feeling some pressure, like, hey, we got to get on top of this and get on top of it right now. Thank you, everybody, for joining and being a part of this. I look forward to seeing you uh, real soon. Please keep a lookout for that webinar with Warner Norcross and Judd. And hopefully we'll uh, have a lot more additional information to share with you at that time. Thanks all.